It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Little Rock Sustainability Hour, brought to you by the Little Rock Sustainability Commission. Today we will discuss sustainability in and around Little Rock. Our goal is to educate and inform you on how we can all become better stewards of the community and city we live in. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Little Rock Sustainability Hour, a Little Rock Sustainability Commission project in collaboration with the Sustainability Office. My name is Karen Zuccardi, I chair the Little Rock Sustainability Commission, and I am also the host of this show. The Little Rock Sustainability Commission decided to create this space for our community because we believe in the power of sustainability and the great impact that sustainable initiatives can have for our city and our lives. We hope you continue to tune in. As we have discussed in other shows, the meaning of sustainability varies among people. Some people associate sustainability only with the natural environment, but don't forget, environmental sustainability is not the only pillar of sustainability. Do you remember the three pillars of sustainability? I'll give you three seconds to think about this. The three pillars of sustainability are environmental, social, and financial. The bigger picture of sustainability aims to find a point of equilibrium among these three areas. Equally fascinating is knowing that almost every area of our lives is connected to sustainability, hence its pillars, but we often don't connect those important areas of our lives with sustainability. An important aspect that we don't often associate with sustainability is transportation. And that is what today's show is about. We will help connect the dots between sustainability and transportation. It's going to be a very interesting show. Before we get into today's show, I want to remind everyone how the commission is structured. The Little Rock Sustainability Commission has five working teams. They are energy, education and community outreach, transportation, waste and reduction, and envi environment and health and wellness. If you are interested in learning more about how to get involved, please reach out to the Sustainability Office at recycle at littlerock.gov. Also, please follow us on social media. Sustain Little Rock is on Facebook and Instagram. We share valuable information for the Little Rock community on our social media platforms. You can also use hashtags like LRSH, LRSC, Sustain LR, and of course, Unite LR. So now let's welcome our beautiful Latino community. Hola, querida comunidad latina de la ciudad de Little Rock. Muchas gracias por sintonizar de nuevo la Hora de Sustenabilidad, donde vamos a hablar de cómo podemos ser mejores defensores de la naturaleza y de nuestros bolsillos. Hoy vamos a tener un tema súper interesante. Espero que se queden durante todo el programa. Vamos a hablar de la conexión que sí existe entre sostenibilidad y transporte. ¿Te has preguntado qué tienen estas dos cosas en común? Bueno, hoy vamos a hablar de eso. Before we get started, we are going to introduce the concept of sustainable transport. This refers to the broad subject of transport that is sustainable in the series of social, environmental, and climate impacts. Sustainability reflects one of the most fundamental humans' desires to create a better future and to create a better world. It provides guidance for long-term strategic decision-making. Sustainability emphasizes the integrated nature of human activities and therefore the importance of comprehensive planning that coordinates between sectors, jurisdiction, jurisdictions, and groups. Transportation is a key part of everyone's lives. We either drive, take the bus, bike, walk, run or use scooters to get around our city. Today, we are going to talk about this subject in more depth. We hope you enjoy it. Now, I want to invite Lenny Massanelli from the Little Rock Sustainability Office to introduce one of our, our commissioners. Um, KK will be here with us. And today she will be facilitating the interviews with our magnific magnificent guest. I am very excited for the conversations we're going to have today. Hi, Lenny, thanks for wanting to come back to the show. I'm glad to see that you're not tired of us. <laughs> Hi, Karen, of course, happy to be here. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Little Rock Sustainability Hour. As Karen said, I will introduce Commissioner KK DeRosset. KK is the chair of the transportation team. She grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi, but has lived in Arkansas since 2014. She has a Master of Education and Graduate Certificate in Sustainability from the University of Arkansas and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Mississippi. While at Ole Miss, KK coordinated the Office of Sustainability's Green Grove Game Day Recycling Initiative from 2011 to 2014. In 2014, KK moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas to pursue a graduate degree. While at the University of Arkansas, she worked in the Office for Sustainability on Zero Waste Initiative, Game Day Recycling, and Campus Waste Audits. KK served as a graduate assistant for Razorback Food Recovery Program and Full Circle Food Pantry. In 2016, KK moved to Little Rock to work at the Arkansas Food Bank as the Feeding America Child Hunger Corps member. KK DeRosset has been the project coordinator at the Central Arkansas Library System since October 2018. She coordinates the Be Mighty Little Rock campaign. The campaign's goal is to increase access to free after school, weekend, and summer meal programs for kids and teens. KK lives in Hillcrest and is a member of Our Lady of the Holy Souls Catholic Church. Hi, KK. Hi, Lenny. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Now I'll tell you a little bit more about the transportation team. We work to make our community more sustainable as it relates to public transportation, biking, and walking. Educating the community about public transportation is one of the important components of this team. Tonight, we hope to do just that. In addition to these topics, we advocate to the City of Little Rock's Mayor and Board of Directors for sustainable transit. This includes advocating for a comprehensive complete streets plan that includes master plans related to biking, walking, and trails. We would like to create more permanent no car zones where people can walk and bike safely. Many cities have been experimenting with this um, as types of solutions to help alleviate the consequences of COVID-19. We aren't only concerned about creating equitable transit paths, we're also interested in electric vehicles. To get started, let's review a few definitions of sustainable transit. According to the European Conference of Ministers of Transport, a sustainable transport system is one that is accessible, safe, environmentally friendly, and affordable. That sounds good to me. The Brentland Commission says that sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now that we've discussed the Sustainability Commission and defined sustainable transport, it's time to introduce our guest. We have several guests that are going to help us learn more about these topics. Each guest works in the transportation sector. They will cover bike and pedestrian transit, public transit, city fleet, and electric vehicles. Buckle up, let's go for a ride. First, we're gonna hear from Dr. John Lindowski with the City of Little Rock. John is a trained ecologist. He earned his BS at the University of Michigan, his PhD at Western Michigan University, a postdoc at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and served on the faculty of Eastern Connecticut State University. While this background may not be intuitive for a municipal bicycle and pedestrian coordinator, John's background in education, statistics, public speaking, and grant writing have been strong assets in the position. John has promoted Little Rock in presentations at several national conferences and helped secure over 10 grants worth over 4 million combined to promote walking and biking in Little Rock. Dr. John Lindowski is the city of Little Rock's bicycle and pedestrian coordinator working out of the public works department. His job is to improve walking and biking in Little Rock for recreation or transportation. These improvements promote livability, tourism, health, safety, economic development, and equity, all of which are key city goals. 
Hi, John. Thanks for joining us today. To get started, could you tell us why the city should be interested in promoting walking and biking? Well, geez, for a lot of reasons. Walking and biking improve health, quality of life, transportation equity, and of course, sustainability. They encourage tourism, economic investment, and development. It certainly makes sense that walking and biking improve health. Well, this pandemic has taught us that maximizing your baseline health before you get sick can help your health outcomes when you do get sick. Walkable and bikeable communities are slimmer, more physically active communities with healthier air. What's more, biking for transportation has been shown to be particularly effective at promoting health, presumably because you lock functional physical movement into your daily life instead of trying and often failing to make time in your busy work schedule to work out. Walking and biking, especially for transportation, can make you more physically resilient in general and to COVID-19 in particular. The connection between walking and biking and economic development is not as intuitive for me. Can you help me connect the dots? Businesses invest where they can attract and retain a creative class workforce. And more and more, these creative class individuals are moving based on where they want to live rather than a, than a specific job opportunity. Quality of life investments, especially bike and pedestrian investments, keep Little Rock economically competitive now and into the future. You mentioned transportation equity. What is that? Well, for many people listening to this, if you want to go somewhere within the city, you hop in your personal car and you drive there. If you have that as an option, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But a lot of Little Rock residents don't have that option due to age, age health condition, or income. Walking and biking give the the young and old independence they wouldn't otherwise have. Considering income, the cost of a car ownership is about $10,000 per year. Our medium uh, per capita income is a little under $30,000 a year. And our median household income is about $46,000 per year. What does that mean? Well, it means a significant portion of our population doesn't have access to a reliable personal automobile. Not having a reliable way of getting to work or school can perpetuate poverty. You missed work, you're late, you're fired. Providing equal access to jobs means providing car optional ways to get to work. I've heard equity more in the context of race lately. Is racial equity relevant to this conversation? Uh, this is an uh, uncomfortable but important topic. First, let me acknowledge my limitations to speak to this in this space as a white man. But from my perspective, the short answer is yes. First, there are a lot of misconceptions about race and biking in Little Rock. One thing I've heard repeatedly is that black people don't bike. Well, yeah, if your concept of biking is someone in Lycra riding a carbon fiber bike, it's true that black people may be underrepresented in that group, but certainly not absent. Check out the Major Taylor's riding group. However, we also know that black people are about three times more likely to be hit by a car while biking versus white people in our metro area. Why is that? One possible explanation is that because race and income are correlated, black residents are overrepresented in biking for transportation in Little Rock because they use this mode out of necessity rather than choice. Another possible explanation is that where we have chosen to invest in bike facilities to date. That's why I'm so excited that Metroplan recently awarded the city $3 million to build the Tri Creek Greenway as a bike and pedestrian transportation corridor and traditionally underserved Southwest Little Rock. This is an equity project. Thank you for that. All of these reasons are important to the commission, but of course we are particularly concerned with walking and biking as they relate to sustainability. Right, this is actually related to my area of academic study. Our climate is changing as a result of human activity. Roughly half of human caused warming is due to carbon dioxide emissions and the biggest CO2 emissions sector is transportation. The good news is that we as a region have a great potential to address carbon emissions through changes in transportation. Out of 52 comparable communities, Little Rock, the Little Rock metro area has the most average vehicle miles traveled at 39.8 miles per person per day, the highest out of 52 communities in the study. Actions to decrease miles driven are key to increasing sustainability in our region. So I hear you saying that driving less will increase sustainability, but making fewer trips or shorter trips by car or walking or biking instead of driving are all personal choices. Can the city as a government entity do anything to decrease vehicle miles traveled? 
Excellent question. Think about West Little Rock. Many of the shops, uh, many of us shop at Lowe's, Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Chanel, or any of the other destination businesses out there. How did you get there last? You probably drove. Have you ever visited any of those destinations other than by car? No, that's, that's not due to just personal choice. There are design issues at play. First, those destinations may be too far from your home to easily walk or bike. Second, streets are not designed for you to easily or safely access those places by bike. Okay, so how could design be different to encourage walking and biking? Okay, I'll preface this by saying I'm not a planner or a historian, and there are people who could speak more fluently to this. Early in the 20th century, we, and I'm talking about the U.S. generally here, uh, not Little Rock, but Little Rock isn't any exception to this, uh, started transitioning from mixed-use neighborhood-based city planning to what's called Euclidean zoning. Euclidean zoning is where city government separates activities and space. Heavy industry, you go over there. Single-family housing, you're here. Shopping district, we'll put you over here. This makes some sense initially, but we took it to the extreme. Now, depending on where you live in the city, you have to travel a lot of miles to live your daily life. So by separating land uses in space, we increase the distance required to do something like get a haircut or go to the grocery store to the point where you typically need a car to do th those things. Yes, urban planner Jeff Speck calls this uh, the car a prosthetic device in this landscape, and it doesn't affect everyone the same. Some people, due to their age, health, or income level, are better equipped to travel these longer distances than others, which means this new cars-only landscape stacks the deck for some people's success over others. That's a transportation equity problem. But as we got more and more extreme with this Euclidean separation, and as we made required travel times even longer by deliberately disconnecting the street grid into cul-de-sac cul streetscapes, Everybody got tired of spending so much time behind the wheel of a car. So in response, instead of returning to a traditional neighborhood design, we, and again, I'm using we from a national perspective, moved even farther from it, transitioning away from our traditional street uh, block grid based on a street system uh, and started building a dendritic street network where some streets were primarily designed to access properties, while other streets were primarily designed to move cars long distances. These car mover streets, think University Avenue, Cantrell Road, or in the extreme interstate highways, are inherently unsafe places for people to walk or bike. They are even unsafe places for people to walk or bike across, chopping up the city into small quadrants, difficult to travel between without a car. This new type of dendritic street network was intended to make long distance car travel more efficient and thereby make more destinations within our reach, but it also divides us, it redlines us. Did it at least make car travel more efficient? Well, sort of. It did decrease per mile efficiency, but not with the intended effects of reducing traffic or overall daily travel time. After it was easier to travel longer distances by car, in response, people changed their behavior to make more trips and longer trips. Sustainability has the goal of decreasing miles driven. This new street system increases miles driven, increases the need for a car as an individual prosthetic device, it makes transportation less equitable. In the short term, this increased efficiency might make you more willing to drive to West Little Rock to a chain big box store versus a local store to save a few bucks. But as a result, local stores go out of business and people need to go to that big box store to get their stuff because there's nowhere else in town that has it. Now this miles driven problem is entrenched in our landscape. More efficient car travel per mile also means that people are more willing to buy a home far from where they work. Again, this decision go beyond a daily choice to be a long-term miles-driven problem and a city of Little Rock tax base problem as our workforce decides to live in low density in Little Rock, which creates greater street ser and services costs for the city, or even outside of the city borders so that they're not paying property taxes to fund the Little Rock services they use daily in their daily work life. So all of this is to say that how the city uh, zones districts and our personal decisions about where we shop and live can have long lasting impacts on walkability, bikeability, and vehicle miles traveled that we can't solve with a sidewalk or a bike lane. What I'm hearing you say is that there are two basic challenges to walking and biking for transportation. First, destinations are spread too far apart. 
And second, connecting streets are now designed to move cars at the expense of the safety and convenience of people who would otherwise use streets to also walk and bike. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely correct. To increase transportation sustainability, we need to decrease miles driven, and that can't be done without addressing both of those challenges. But if destinations are already spread too far apart, aren't we sort of locked into this problem? Well, nothing we build is permanent, but yes, the problems created by Euclidean zoning will not be solved overnight. To decrease miles driven and increase transportation equity now with our existing land use patterns, transit can be combined with biking and walking to provide complementary long, medium, and short distance transportation alternatives. Transit, biking, and walking options are interdependent, often used by someone in the same trip to get to one place to another, and the infrastructure supporting it all needs to be strong to provide a viable transportation alternative to the personal automobile. Rock Region Metro's Becca Green is also part of this forum and could provide even more insight. Okay, so what's the city doing to address these challenges to promote walking and biking as transportation alternatives? Well, we're doing several things. In the 1980s, we created our first master bike plan. That plan was adopted into the master street plan as official city policy in the 1990s. We're about to undergo a 14 month process to overhaul the plan and make it more actionable. One component of that plan will be an equity analysis so we can see where, uh, where we have the most zero car households, most single parent family households, uh, we can look at racial income and other demographics and prioritize biking infrastructure according to those uh, equity measures. We're also creating an off-street bike and pedestrian trail network. Most of the work for the Arkansas River Trail was done in the 2000s. While people often think about this as a recreational facility, it, combined with the emerging Tri Creek Greenway Southeast Trail and Southwest Trail, have the potential to become a network of bike and pedestrian transportation corridors, especially when completed and connected to other paved trails and in an interconnected on-street bike network. Every year we're making steady progress toward this goal. What does it take to create a useful on-street bicycle network? Well, one thing, as I mentioned, is a bike master plan to determine where bike facilities are possible and most useful. That plan will be improving soon. Another thing is a mandate to do so, which the City Board of Directors gave with the Complete Streets Resolution in 2013 and the Complete Streets Ordinance in 2015. I've heard the City's Complete Streets Ordinance won an award. It did. Smart Growth America called it one of the strongest ordinances of 2015. What makes it so strong? Well, the biggest thing is the exceptions clause. Basically, it says that as default policy, the city should be designing streets for walking, biking, and transit, as well as personal vehicles, whenever we build or resurface streets, unless one of five exceptions is met. Because of this language, we should be converting our street network to be as safe and welcome, welcoming to walk and bike as we maintain it over time. Is the city doing anything else to promote walking and biking? Well, let me get back to what it takes to build a non-street network. We covered a plan and a mandate. Stagnation in old priorities and processes is always easier than innovation. To redesign streets to welcome walking and biking transportation, you also need strong, informed, and engaged leadership. Mayor Scott ran on platforms of mobility, equity, and quality of life, all of which are part of this conversation. When he took office, he organized several citizen-led transition teams around these goals. Their efforts and our future priorities are documented in the Scott script. You can Google that or check it out on Bikeped Little Rock. Mayor Scott was recently chosen by Smart Growth America to be in its inaugural Champions Institute group, which shows elected officials how they can lead most effectively to promote complete streets. I think Mayor Scott and his overarching goal to unite Little Rock is going to be a visionary leader here. It sounds like the pieces are falling into place to make a more complete on-street bicycle network. Is there anything else going on to facilitate walking or biking transportation? Well, in 2021, we're also going to be launching a pedal assist bike share system in the downtown area. That's great. Well, yeah, as you know, it was one of your uh, 17 Road to 2020 objectives and also a key League of American Bicyclists recommendation. Even if people drive to the downtown area to work, this will allow them to keep their cars parked during the day. It will allow a transportation alternative for residents to allow more uh, efficient access 
to rock region metro buses, even without a bike of their own. How many bikes will there be? How many stations? There's going to be about 200 bikes in Little Rock and possibly more in North Little Rock. There will be between 20 and 25 stations. We're still finalizing site station approval. That's great. You said pedal assist. What's that? Well, if you've ever ridden a bike share bike in a major metro area, you may have ridden a sturdy but heavy bike. Physical ability can deter people from using the system. Pedal Assist has a motor inside each bike so that much less effort is needed to zip around town. Wow, cool. Does it address transportation equity? Yes, low-income residents will be able to subscribe to the system at a greatly reduced rate. Well, checking off a road to 2020 objective seemed like a great way to close our discussion. Thank you, John, for your time today. Next, we're gonna hear from Becca Green with Rock Region Metro. Becca Green, Rock Region Metro Director of Public Engagement, joined the organization in July, 2015, and is responsible for strategic planning, public relations, collateral and content development, governmental affairs, media buying, website and social media management, community outreach, and more. Prior to her current role, Green served six years as Director of Marketing and Communications at Access, a Little Rock-based nonprofit serving individuals with learning and developmental disabilities. She managed several hospitality industry accounts at CJRW, Arkansas's largest advertising agency. And she also served as the Director of Marketing and Public Relations for Arkansas Repertory Theater. Let's start with some basic information about Rock Region Metro because I understand that some people in our area haven't been exposed to several different public transit systems and may not know much about the organization. Sure, well, Rock Region Metro is the public transit agency serving Pulaski County and the jurisdictions within it, mainly Little Rock and North Little Rock. We were established in 1986 through an interlocal agreement among local jurisdictions. So again, uh, among the county and the cities of Little Rock and North Little Rock. And at the time, there were some other local jurisdictions in there as well. We are the state's largest public transit agency, and we're one of eight small urban public transit agencies in Arkansas. So there's Ozark Regional Transit and Razorback Transit up in Northwest Arkansas, and the cities of Fort Smith, Texarkana, Jonesboro, and Hot Springs also have their own agencies. But we are the largest, and we are serving what is arguably Arkansas's sole urban core. Um, we're regulated by the Federal Transit Administration, Region 6, and um, we are the designated public transit agency for the Little Rock urbanized area, which is determined by the U.S. Census. The Little Rock urbanized area actually comprises uh, not just the city of Little Rock, but also the cities of Benton, Bryant, Jacksonville, and Cabot. So, for example, if the city of Benton wanted to start a public transit agent, uh, agency in a service, and they wanted to marry that with some federal funding dollars for public transit, they could do that by working through Rock Region Metro because they are within the Little Rock urbanized area. We are managed by a board of directors, uh, 12 members. Uh, Little Rock gets the most of those members. It gets five seats because Little Rock has the most public transit service. That's followed by three seats for North Little Rock, two for Pulaski County, and then we also currently have a, two seats one each for Maumel and Sherwood, um, and we'll get to why here in a minute. And we also are managed by um, a diverse and talented team here. We have more than 200 employees, 130 of which are bus and paratransit operators. And we also have about 25 maintenance employees. Those operators and maintenance employees are part of a national transit union called the Amalgamated Transit Union. Their chapter is Local 704. And then the rest of the team is comprised, um, is composed of uh, streetcar operators, microtransit operators, um, supervisors, dispatchers, and administrators. We have three facilities. Probably the best known is the downtown Little Rock bus station. And then we're also over our headquarters are on the other side of the river in North Little Rock at the edge of Argenta, right before the railroad tracks. And we have been there since 1991. And we also have one other facility on the North Little Rock side of the river, and that is our streetcar barn where the streetcar vehicles are stored. Thank you. So we've all seen the buses around town. What other services does Metro have? 
Well, we do. Um, the buses are the primary service, of course. We have uh, 15 bus routes pending some changes uh, that are coming down the pipe next year, which we'll talk about. We have 59 buses total, and in, on normal service hours on a weekday, we have, uh, during peak times, 49 buses in operation. So lots going on there. Um, we actually, pre-pandemic, had a 5% increase in bus ridership from 2018 to 2019, which was um, sort of an anomaly on the nationwide uh, landscape. And uh, that was pretty exciting because usually when you have low unemployment and low gas prices, you also have low transit ridership. So we sort of bucked that trend. And you've also probably noticed around town the blue Metrolinx vehicles. That is our paratransit service. It's a disability-based on-demand service for eligible riders. Um, it is a service that you must book 24 hours in advance, but it is on demand. So on demand, you can book it 24 hours in advance and get from point A to point B. And um, we have 24 vehicles for that. Of course, during peak time service, we have about 15 of those vehicles in operation. And that is a service that's based up to three quarters of a mile off all of our fixed routes. So the service area ends up looking like this sort of amoeba-like shape, if you will, that kind of follows all of our fixed bus routes um, to get people where they need to go. We also have the streetcar service, which um, it is not running right now as part of our COVID-19 response, but in regular non-pandemic times, we have two streetcar lines, the blue line, which serves both Little Rock and North Little Rock, and the green line, which serves Little Rock. And then finally, we have um, a couple of newer services, one of which is Metro Connect Microtransit Service. This is an on-demand ride hailing service that is similar to Uber Pool. So it's a shared ride and you can um, hail the ride through an app, or if you don't have a smartphone, you can, you can dial in a number directly to dispatch. We launched the service last year. And in the first year, we've had more than 15,000 trips on the service. Um, so the, the service is really intended to um, provide some access to the transit network where maybe um, the demand is lower and not doesn't warrant a 35 or 40 foot mass transit bus going through the area. Um, it's been very successful. We started with the John Barrow Road Zone last year. Um, then we added the Riverdale Zone, actually what, in what ended up being about the first week of the pandemic. And since the pandemic started, we have launched two other zones that are temporary zones to help us with our COVID-19 response. And those zones are for Hensley and then also another zone that, that covers the shorter college area in North Little Rock and then the uh, East Little Rock area of Hanger Hill and College Station. Um, so I'll give you an example of why that, that service is really popular. Um, for example, Car Tie, which is in uh, Little Rock, sort of near our Route 3, um, it's still not close enough for a lot of people because it's, it's down a street that's kind of in the woods and there's no sidewalk on that street. There's um, a pretty significant incline. And then if you just finished chemotherapy treatment, for example, at Cartai, you're not going to want to walk up that hill. So the Metro Connect service allows us to have smaller vehicles to take people directly to the doorstep of car tie while using the public transit system. And it's all for a very affordable public transit fare. Um, so it's been really popular. Then we have another service that we launched also during the first week of the pandemic. Um, we've been working on it for a couple of years, but we launched it uh, the, earlier this year. It's called Metro Pool. And it is the state's first public transit van pool program and possibly the first in our FTA region. Um, but basically that is a federally funded public transit program. It's a jobs access program. So uh, you can get groups of riders who, who maybe live near each other and are going to the same workplace or workplaces that are close to each other. They can um, get a vehicle, uh, ride together to work. And then um, at the end of the day, uh, ride back together to their um, various homes. And it's um, all managed for us turnkey by commute with enterprise. So this is the same enterprise that you use to rent vehicles. It's, it's been a pretty successful program so far. Surprisingly, during the pandemic, we've been able to launch five different van pool groups and they're going to places like UAMS, the VA and um, another uh, company called Transco. Wow, that's a lot. So can you tell us who pays for this? Sure. Well, we have uh, an annual operating budget of just under $20 million. 
Most of that budget uh, per year comes from our local funding jurisdictions, uh, which makes sense because the public transit agency is here in central Arkansas. It is not in Washington, DC. So the primary beneficiaries of that service are the local jurisdictions. So they're, they're paying the biggest chunk of that pie. The second largest funding source is the federal government. So we do get federal funding for public transit. Third largest funding source is direct revenue, which is mainly made up of our fare payments from our riders. Um, and there is a little bit of direct revenue that comes from advertising, but of course, uh, advertising can be volatile and there is a ceiling on that, especially during a pandemic. It seems like one of the first things that people cut. And then finally, um, it, fourth largest funding source would be um, some, some state funding that we do receive. Out of the local jurisdictions, Little Rock pays the most because Little Rock has the most transit service that is being operated within its jurisdiction. And second to that would be North Little Rock followed by Pulaski County. Thank you. So what's the status of public transit right now, especially during the pandemic? Great question. So we have two main goals right now. One is to protect public health, including the uh, health of our employees and our riders. But also the other is to continue to provide an essential public service, which is public transit. So um, it's been challenging. Uh, basically our goal is to keep as much service on the roads as we can right now, while also encouraging um, you know, COVID-19 CDC guidelines like wearing masks and social distancing. Um, so we've done that in a variety of ways. We have limited the passengers on our vehicles and we've had to um, suspend some routes to shift around and reallocate resources as part of our COVID-19 response. Um, we were already uh, cleaning the vehicles daily. We already had hand sanitizer on all the vehicles prior to the pandemic, but of course we have stepped up those efforts doing extra cleaning, extra sanitization. Um, a lot of that we're doing down at the travel center so riders can see that the buses and the vehicles are getting sanitized and feel more comfortable riding. Um, we have installed plexiglass barriers between the operators and the fare box so um, there's a little more barrier between riders and the and the operators as people are boarding the buses um, we're doing daily screenings for all of our employees we have ion filtration systems on the vehicles um, so we've done a lot of different things and you know when you look across the country um, a lot of public transit systems are really taking a hit with ridership during the pandemic. Some, some systems have lost as much as 70 to 80% of their riders. Here in, in central Arkansas, we've seen maybe about 50%. So it's less. And I think that the reason for that is something that we all know here at the transit agency. And that is that public transit service is really essential to a lot of people here in central Arkansas. They are depending on it to get to jobs, healthcare, um, different things. So um, that, that has really been a focus of ours. Um, during the pandemic, we've also, prior to the pandemic and during it, we've had a, a project that we're working on, the Ride 2020 project, which is a comprehensive operational analysis and a transit network design. Um, so part of that has been taking a critical look at how the routes are performing and whether they're meeting the transit needs in our community. Um, we were able, after a lot of public outreach this year, um, to make a series of recommendations to improve the transit service that were approved by our board in August. Um, because we're still in our COVID-19 response, we're not going to launch these changes until next year, but we um, are excited to begin on them because they help to increase access to transit within Pulaski County, which is important. And they're also, um, we're able to do things like increase access to 30 minute service. So prior to these changes, we've had some routes in the system that don't have a bus maybe for every 15, uh, every 45 minutes or an hour, which is not great service. So we were able to increase the frequency of the buses on those routes, which is important for getting people where they need to go. We've been able to increase the span of service. So the buses are running a little bit later with these changes. Um, there'll be more weekend service with these changes. And we've also been able to expand bus routes um, into an area of our community that's received a lot of development over the past few decades where we haven't had an opportunity to provide a bus route. So for example, there's been a lot of development throughout the last few years in West Little Rock 
um, not just the last few years, the last few decades. And for the first time, we'll be able to expand our transit system beyond the intersection of Chanel and Markham to go to the intersection of Chanel and Rawling. Um, our research tells us that there are more than 2,500 jobs out that way. So that is the number one rider request that we've received over the last five and a half years is to, to get some transit route access to those jobs. And we're going to be able to do that in 2021. We're also going to be able to wrap up a transit oriented development project that we've been doing uh, for the downtown Little Rock bus station, which is called the River Cities Travel Center. And that's just to reimagine what we could do with that space. So, you know, you may have gone to bigger cities where they have transit hubs and they might have some retail um, offerings on the bottom floor along with transit and then have some some other stuff going on upstairs, like maybe offices or housing or artist studio space or different things like that. So we have been engaged in a feasibility study to see what we could do with the square block, um, city block that we own downtown in Little Rock to see um, if we can make that be more beneficial to both the transit agency and the community. Um, we're also working on an unconstrained transit network. So part of the Ride 2020 project was the budget neutral changes that I just walked you through a minute ago, but we also have um, the opportunity to come up with a transit network that is unlimited by budget constraints and to see what the price tag would be for a full build out of what people want here from the transit system um, with frequencies and, and new routes and, and things like that. And to just, just get a handle on how much does that really cost um, so we can figure out whether it's feasible to put some of those um, changes into play in the future uh, to benefit the, the Little Rock metro area and our state's capital city. Wow, y'all have a lot going on. Um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Well, hopefully I've given you guys enough to, to know that um, the Metro team is prepared and capable of building a robust transit system that the Central Arkansas community can be proud of. And at the same time, it's not just the, the Metro staff's decision about um, what we do with public transit in our area. It's really a community decision. So I just want to leave your listeners with this thought. Do you think our public transit system meets the needs of our senior citizens? Does it align with Gen Z and millennial lifestyle desires? Does it provide a socially just equitable option to a car to get around? Does it get people to jobs? And does it make our capital city metro area competitive with other similar metro areas across the country? Um, if you wanna continue this conversation and, and, and while you're thinking about these things and, and public transit, um, there are a couple of ways to stay involved with us. We have an e-newsletter that you can sign up for at the bottom of our website. You can follow us on social media, RR Metro. Um, you can read our Ride 2020 plan and you can read all about the budget neutral um, designs that we have coming in 2021, hopefully, um, online under the Rider Information tab. Um, Post-pandemic, I would encourage you to, you know, right now we're doing essential trips only, but post-pandemic, I would encourage you to ride the system. Get out and um, maybe get out there on a Saturday and check it out and, and ride it if you've never been on a city bus. And then also um, feel free to continue the conversation with us. You know, if you have any questions, you can email us at info at rrmetro.org. And um, we also have been doing transit tours prior to the pandemic where we take groups of citizens in small groups to ride on the system and show them different aspects about what we do. We would love to have people who are interested in sustainability do this with us. So email us and let us know if you're interested. Again, that's info at rrmetro.org. Well, Becca, our time together has come to an end, but I wanna thank you for your time and the passion you bring to such an important subject. Please stay in touch with the commission and let us know how we can continue to be of support. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Our third guest is Monica Creighton. Monica is here to talk with us about the City of Little Rock's fleet. Monica Creighton has been employed with the City of Little Rock for eight years. She serves in the administration division in fleet services as the Administrative Systems Operations Coordinator. Her responsibilities include serving on various city committees to include the City of Little Rock's Green Team. 
She has been a member of the green team for four years. Every day she's assisting fleet services in keeping Little Rock rolling. Hi, Monica. Thank you for being here with us today. Hi, thank tell you us, for having me. Can you tell us about the city's fleet? Sure. Uh, currently, the city's fleet is comprised of approximately 1,300 vehicles and equipment. Our diverse fleet ranges from small mowing equipment to fire department ladder trucks and everything in between. Fleet strategizes for sustainability from cradle to the grave. And by cradle, we mean the acquisitions process and the grave being the retirement remarketing disposal aspect. We always source vehicles and equipment with sustainability in mind. For example, we purchase specific brands or types of vehicles and equipment that will yield a higher resale. By doing this, when it's time to retire these units, we have a larger pool of potential buyers that will want to purchase these units and we are able to capture more interest. This also allows the units to stay in use instead of having these retired units end up scrapped and of course winding in the landfill creating more waste. So what's the current situation as far as alternative fueled electric vehicles or units? So we are implementing plans for alternative and renewable fueled vehicles and researching advanced vehicle technologies and fuel saving strategies. This is all while connecting and working in partnership with our local Clean Cities Coalition to help reach our goals to become a cleaner and efficient city. Of the 1300 vehicles and equipment that we have, approximately 1000 are on road vehicles. Of the 1,000 on-road vehicles, 300 are either E85 or EcoBoost. And e E85 is blended fuel uh, containing more ethanol than regular gasoline, and it burns cleaner than your typical gasoline. It can be cheaper per gallon, but slightly higher in cost per mile. We plan to add E85 tanks at all of our City of Little Rock fuel stations, and this will be for city-owned vehicles only. Also, we own 29 hybrid electric vehicles. And by hybrid, that means that the vehicles have both gasoline and electric engines on board. The electric engine works in conjunction with onboard lithium battery to power the vehicle while idling. We are currently acquiring 51 hybrid electric Ford Interceptor SUVs for the Little Rock Police Department and those units should be in service by the end of quarter one, 2021. I would like to note that the Little Rock Police Department has two fully electric units that can be used on road and are used to work the downtown river market area and Public Works has two international dump trucks that are hybrids. In addition, the Little Rock Zoo has approximately 25 fully electric carts that are used on the zoo grounds to meet the operational needs of the zoo staff. That's awesome. What's the city's plan for purchasing more alternative vehicles in the future? We are in the process, like I said, of acquiring 51 more hybrid electric vehicles to utilize in our police department. Our current focus is on obtaining hybrid vehicles. We are working to implement future replacements toward alternative fuel vehicles when feasible. We do not plan to purchase any vehicles in the lightweight class that are not hybrid. And by lightweight, I mean that's the regular pickup trucks and sedans that the police and code enforcement officers use. By doing this, we are positioning ourselves to be ready for the electric future. So how can people living in Little Rock support sustainable transportation? Good question. The next time you're shopping for a vehicle, consider the hybrid or EV options. You can imagine that the cost will be slightly higher, but there are some overall savings. I'll give you an example. The Toyota Camry has a hybrid option. The 2021 LE model starts at approximately 24,970. It gets up to 28 miles per gallon in the city and 39 on the highway. That's about a 
$1,500 difference from the hybrid LE that starts at 27,270 and gets up to 51 miles per gallon in the city and 53 on the highway. Now keep in mind, these are only the base models for each and does not include any add-ons. Chevrolet has the Bolt EV that is a compact car. It starts at approximately 36,500. That's a substantial difference over the Camry hybrid, but again, that is a fully electric vehicle. When looking at those options, you do have to consider what works best for your family, but how do you get there? One way that citizens can support this movement is by telling your lawmakers that you want legislative bills passed that will give tax credits for these purchases. So you're not ready to make a big purchase like that, but you want to support sustainable transportation? Consider walking, cycling, carpooling, or car sharing. Planning your errands so your driving is minimal. Little Rock is definitely improving its roads to make it safer for cyclists. John Landowski with the Little Rock Bike Ped Program has some wonderful information on what the city is doing in that area. Thank you. We actually got to talk with John earlier. Can you tell us about the future of electric vehicle ownership and about the city's infrastructure to support it? Yeah. So if you look around now, there are some charging stations for electric vehicles that have been installed by private citizens and companies. We recognize the progression that is happening towards electric vehicles. And with funding, we are supportive in implementing infrastructure that is conducive to this change. Do you have a challenge for the citizens of Little Rock? Sure. If you can, the next time you need to run to the local market, consider walking or carpool with others in your neighborhood. I know that that may not be feasible now, but we will get back there. We can all make a small contribution in making our city more sustainable. Thank you so much for joining us today, Monica. We appreciate you taking some time out of your day to help us learn about the city of Little Rock's fleet. Thank you for having me. Our fourth guest of the evening is Jenna Denny. Jenna with Today's Power is here to talk with us about electric vehicles. Jenna Denny, an award-winning advertiser, is the marketing and public relations coordinator for Today's Power Specializing in marketing, public relations, and communications, Jenna joined today's power team as the WOW coordinator in 2016 after graduating from the University of Central Arkansas. Since joining today's power, Jenna has assisted with unity programming, cooperative event planning, and communication, and has been involved with the addition of electric vehicles and charging stations to TPI's product line. Hi, Jenna. Thank you for being with us today. Can you tell us about today's power? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. We're excited and charged up about EVs, you know, year round. And so this opportunity is excellent. Uh, today's power, we were created in November of 2014. So we're getting ready to celebrate our sixth birthday soon. Um, and we were created by the Arkansas Electric Cooperatives, Inc. And this is mainly to serve the electric cooperative footprint here in Arkansas. Um, if you're not familiar, we have about 17 distribution cooperatives across the state. And we were formed basically to meet their needs and desires to have renewable energy, such as solar power. This has become larger than just solar power since then. You know, today's power is the energy partner for all renewable and technologically advanced innovations that lead to an improvement in the quality of life and the energy we consume. Our mission at Today's Power is to improve the quality of life in the communities we serve by providing leading technologies and services in a sustainable and fiscally, manner, fiscally responsible manner. And that does include the transportation sector when it comes to EV charging infrastructure and the vehicles themselves. So what does your role as the marketing and public relations coordinator at Today's Power entail? What does a typical day look like for you? So that, you know, that a typical day for a marketing and public relations coordinator at Today's Power, it varies. 
you know, but above all else, it is my job to provide transparent, honest, and integral information as it pertains to new and maybe confusing to some people, renewable and sustainable technologies, specifically in the commercial, industrial, utility, and public sectors. You know, with new technologies, there's always a learning curve and some level of skepticism. And that paired with some bad actors and false information um, to promote sales, you know, we truly felt like it, it was my goal as the communication specialist here to position ourselves as an industry leader to provide the education that Arkansas needs on solar, battery energy storage, and electric vehicle charging stations. You know, a, a fun fact I like to say about EVs is that one of the biggest misconceptions and reasons that folks are hesitant to adopt EVs is just their lack of knowledge about how to charge and the availability of chargers that may be in their backyard. But in 2017, I put on a bonus hat for today's power where uh, we started looking into EV chargers and how to deploy these technologies across the state to you know, relieve some of the range anxiety of our Kansans who may be interested in adopting an electric vehicle as their mode of transportation. And so we started evaluating products um, as far as EV chargers that we would see at the public sector at state buildings and city parking garages and trying to find the best and reliable product that we could have for our employees and patrons and the communities that we work in. And then on a personal level, um, I have been involved with the, some of the folks on this call, including the Office of Sustainability here in Little Rock and the ADEQ for Drive Electric Week. Uh, we've been doing that together for three years now. Um, and I've had the honor to serve as the city captain for that for the past two years. So EVs are a huge part of what I do, even though it may not be in the title that I have. Thank you. Could you share some of the benefits of EVs and why does today's power promote these benefits? You know, going right back to our mission, you know, we do strive to improve the quality of life in the communities we serve through these leading technologies. And EVs, they produce savings, clean air, less noise pollution, and the ability to fuel with locally generated power rather than foreign fossil fuels. So, I mean, those are some of the big benefits. When we're talking about saving money, we're talking about comparing the regular maintenance of a combustion engine or ICE, internal combustion engine, as we like to call them, versus an electric vehicle. You know, your regular maintenance looks like no oil changes, no brake pad or replacements, no spark plug replacements. But the only thing you really have to worry about regularly are the tires. So your maintenance checklist has been reduced and so are those costs associated with that. And you know, in Arkansas, we're lucky to have very affordable rates and electricity is cheaper than you can get a gallon of gas. You know, at level two's charging stations found here in Little Rock, you can get it for a gallon, an equivalent of a gallon of gas for $1.13 a gallon and you know, even at the lowest prices, you know, during the beginning of the COVID quarantine, gas prices were never reached that low. So we're still seeing parity with EV chargers. Um, also, say hello to clean air. There's zero tailpipe emissions from driving an electric vehicle. And again, that's reducing our dependency on the fossil fuels and more on domestically, you know, locally grown power. And above all else, have you guys driven an EV? They are sleek and stealthy. You do not hear anything whenever you are approaching one or driving by one. I know I've been on the highway driving next to a 18 wheeler and I almost have to turn up the radio like five more notches just to not hear all of the sound that's associated with some of the bigger rigs. So those are the big benefits of EVs, saving money, saving the air quality and your noise quality as well as reducing our need for traditional fossil fuels. That sounds good to me. Can you tell me about the future of EVs in Little Rock? Sure, you know, there are currently over 35 charging stations that anyone can pull up and charge at that are available to the public here in Little Rock. And, you know, many of them are all dual port stations, meaning they can charge two cars at once. So the ability to charge is already here. I do see in the future some opportunities for more infrastructure, you know, with programs that the ADEQ is administering for level two and DC fast chargers, which are comparing those two level two 
is about 25 miles of range per hour versus about 50 to 100 per hour on a DC fast. So you're looking at some on the go versus in town charging opportunities there that'll be you know, made available to the public through this program. And we're hoping to see some information on that program early in the new year, um, as well as you know, the increase of the actual vehicles is driving that infrastructure growth. You know, Looking at list from you know, a couple of years ago of the registration of EVs in Arkansas, you know, it was barely, barely toppling the 600 registrations across the state. And now we have over 1,200 full battery electric vehicles, you know, over 1,000 plug-in hybrids, and over 20,000 hybrid electric vehicles in the state. So we are definitely seeing the demand for these types of technologies growing centrally here in Little Rock and the surrounding areas, as well as the Northwest region of the state. Well, thank you so much, Dena. It was great having you today. Thanks for sharing this information about today's power and talking with us about EVs. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me today. I hope you've enjoyed your time with us learning about sustainable transit. Now Karen will share with us the final section of this show. Thank you, Keiki, for facilitating very important conversations this evening. It was great information. Today, in our section, A Look Around the World, we are going to be traveling to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is located in East Asia on the southeast coast of Asia facing the China Sea. It is the world's top city for sustainable transportation. According to the 2017 Sustainable City Mobility Index, Arcadis. Not only that, but Hong Kong is actually a very interesting place. I want to share a couple of fun facts about this city with you today. The first one, this region has the highest average IQ in the world with uh, 107. That's pretty high. And then the second one, the, did you know that the number four is an unlucky number in Chinese because it sounds very much to the word death? So don't be surprised if you go to a building in Hong Kong or in China that you find that the building doesn't have the fourth floor. It's because they feel that this is um, an unlucky number. Uh, but also very fascinating about Hong Kong is its transportation system. As, um, as I said earlier, the 2017 Sustainable, Sustainable Cities Mobility Index um, did, did some research and examined 100 major cities across 23 different indicators to give an um, in, indicative ra ranking to the mobility and sustainability to their transportation systems. Hong Kong leads the world thanks to its innovative and well-connected transport network, which oversees 12.6 million passenger journeys every day. That's massive. Despite its massive and densely concentrated population, Hong Kong's public transport system is widely recognized as being the most sophisticated and efficient for any major city. It is also cheap and handles over 90% of all the daily journeys, the, high, the highest rate in the world. That is pretty incredible. We will travel to another city in the world in our next episode. So um, our time to together is coming to an end, but I'm going to share with you all the sustainability tip and the eco challenge of the week. So for the sustainability tip, we want to encourage our listeners to walk for short trips. Walking helps reduce body fat, lower, lower blood pressure and um, blood pressure and is free. It may also take less time than you think. Studies have shown that most people will underestimate time related to car journeys and overestimate time that it will take to walk. So the, the average walking pace is 3.5 miles per hour. And if you walk, you don't have to find a car bay when you arrive. The eco challenge of the week. So today we want to challenge you to uh, start kind of mapping your commute to work or a school and how long it would take you to walk, bike, or use trans uh, public transport to get there. Um, let us know by sending us an email to recycle at littlerock.org.
So, well, we had had a lot of information in this show today. We hope that you learned new things. Thanks for joining us today uh, to explore transportation and many different ways our city is moving more sustainably. Please don't forget to tune in into our next episode. Bye, everyone. You're listening to the Little Rock Sustainability Hour. Thank you for joining us today, and remember, get Little Rock Sustainability information by going to the Sustain Little Rock Facebook page or the Sustainability section of LittleRock.gov.